Running a marathon is not easy. Ask anyone who's done it, and they'll tell you that it's not just about the 42 kilometers you run on race day. It's about the months or even years of training required, building up strength and stamina to make it to the finish line. And when you cross that finish line, all that preparation becomes oh so worth it. Throughout this series, you might have heard the World Expo being compared to a marathon, and it really is one. Dubai's bid to host the Expo in 2020 was being shaped well before the deciding votes were cast in 2013. From there on, the city embarked on a long eight-year journey until the Expo opened its doors. The story of the UAE at World Expos, however, extends all the way back to 1970, when the people of the Emirates participated in the Osaka Japan Expo. That was before the formation of the Union, what is today known as the United Arab Emirates. What did we want to achieve with all our participations at World Expos? We wanted to tell the world about our past, present, and future. This is Abdullah al Aydarous, whose name is synonymous with the UAE's participation at World and Specialized Expos. He's a former chief executive for support services at the UAE National Media Council, and also served as Deputy Commissioner General and Manager of the UAE Pavilion at Expos from 1992 to 2016. On top of all of that, he was also the UAE Delegate to the Bureau International des Expositions, the BIE, from 1996 to 2016. Our pavilion designs have always been inspired by and celebrated our heritage and our past. Inside the pavilion, we showcase the UAE's modernity and our many achievements today with pictures, performances, films. And at the same time, we tell visitors about all of our plans for the future. So we're really telling our many stories across time. In today's episode, we invite you to run a marathon with us. A marathon that lasts 50 years and takes you around the world as we see how the UAE has participated at different world expos. How did the country prepare the world and itself for the history-making event that would be Expo 2020 Dubai? Are you ready? Feel warmed up? Good. This will be fun. I'm Noon Saleh, and this is Inside Expo, an official podcast of Expo 2020 Dubai, where history is being made. We kick things off in 1968 in Abu Dhabi, where the Emirate was planning its participation at the Osaka Expo in 1970 under the theme of Progress and Harmony for Mankind. Now, you might be wondering, why not call it the UAE's participation? Well, at the time, the Union wasn't formed quite yet. So in 1968, when the time came to discuss involvement in the Osaka Expo, it was specifically Abu Dhabi that would be attending, but that wouldn't be easy. Going back 50 years, you find there were difficulties everywhere. This is His Excellency Rashid al Nuaimi, former UAE Minister of Foreign Affairs, who spearheaded the Abu Dhabi Pavilion at the Osaka Expo in 1970. His Excellency is in his late 80s, but recalls Osaka 1970 as if it happened yesterday. In the beginning, Abu Dhabi was only an emirate, and pavilions and expos were representations for countries. The challenge here was to give a national representation for the emirate of Abu Dhabi. We were able to do this through the special relationship Sheikh Zayed had with Britain, 
a beautiful relationship based on trust. It enabled us to overcome the challenges that allowed us to present ourselves as a country, despite not being a country yet. Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan, the country's late founder and the people's leader at the time, also had strong relations with the leadership of Japan, which increased demand for Abu Dhabi's presence at the expo. And so, with that ambition and vision, His Excellency Rashid al Nuaimi was tasked directly by Sheikh Zayed to start planning for the Osaka Expo. The expo opened its doors on March 15, 1970, and drew nearly 64 million visitors throughout its six-month period. It was known for its unusual artwork and designs, perhaps most famous of which is Tara Okamoto's Tower of the Sun, which still remains on the site today. But no expo is complete without national pavilions. Abu Dhabi was among nearly 80 nations and international organizations that participated and the team had to present a pavilion that would introduce the emirate and its people to the world. We didn't have experience when it comes to expos. We started with constructing the pavilion by looking to our heritage. In our building heritage, there's something called the murabba, which is always in every house, every palace, there's a murabba for defense. There's also a buri, a tower for defense. These are found in the entire area, a region of the Gulf. At the time, His Excellency took with him the city planner, who was responsible for much of the layout of Abu Dhabi, the late legendary Egyptian architect, Dr. Abdurrahman Makhlouf. He was a designer and manager at the Abu Dhabi Urban Planning Department. I took him with me because he was an expert in architecture, an expert in planning, and an expert in design. Dr. Mokhlouf designed the pavilion as a replica of the Jahiri Fort in Al Ain, which was constructed in 1891 under the rule of Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan's grandfather, Sheikh Zayed bin Khalifa. Looking at old photographs and illustrations of the pavilion from Osaka, you can see the same motifs, the same square and cylindrical towers and designs from the Alayan Fort. Above the main entrance to the pavilion, the following phrase was engraved. A door of goodness opens in this glorious chapter where joy and happiness reside. This is our heritage. Al Jahili Fort is a part of our heritage. We brought a company for the design and we brought a company for the execution and so we built the pavilion. The theme of the pavilion was Abu Dhabi, past, present and future. Inside, there was a mix of cultural and technological showcases that spoke to that theme. These ranged from Arabic music and readings of Arabian Nights to displays on oil and how it's extracted and used. But perhaps the most standout experience and proof of just how much of a hit the pavilion was amongst visitors was the Arabic coffee that was served. I decided to set up a small tent at the entrance of the pavilion and offer something. I made some hot water and I had some coffee. So I tried making it. I tried it. The first day, made some coffee and sold it. The second day, I saw a long line. People wanted it. These small plastic cups for one dollar each. And winter came and it got cold. When it was cold, it was very popular. They wanted hot coffee to stay warm. So we started to make more of it. We raised so much money for the pavilion from this little coffee tent and a kettle. And we used to sell coffee with a little bit of cardamom, coffee with a little bit of clove, coffee with a little bit of ginger, three types, each one for a dollar. And each person would try one. Then the following day, they'd come to try another. They loved it. Constructing and curating the pavilion was a feat on its own. But the creative challenges did not stop there. 
This is also one of the amusing stories. During the programming of Expo, there is a national day for celebrating each country, specifically dedicated for them. At this national day, the flag is raised, and the national anthem is played, and we needed to play a national anthem. But we didn't have a national anthem at the time, so we tried to find something to play. We used to have a piece of bagpipes music that was played by the police. This is music that was Scottish. Britain brought us this music. So we took the notes from this, but they told us, this won't work. So I found a music teacher for us to write music, to compose the notes. So what shall we do? Our first inspiration was the camel and the way it moves. We had, for example, the movement of horses. We have the waves, the sound of ocean waves. Three movements. This is part of our heritage. But we need a musician who will understand these things. So I brought this music teacher and we sat down and started composing. And we spent a few days on this operation until we were able to add three movements to the police music. And it got us to something resembling a national anthem. And we made it. His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the UAE's current president, visited the expo for Abu Dhabi's National Day and delivered a speech to mark the special occasion. The pavilion, the Arabic coffee, the national anthem, these stories all have the same spirit of innovation, creativity, and learning that still burns strong in the UAE. What had started as an ambitious vision to put together a pavilion in Osaka in 1970 has today blossomed into a World Expo hosting 192 countries in the UAE. And so the moment Dubai won the bidding process was particularly special for His Excellency. This is definitely a part of me, part of my culture, part of my identity, part of the things that I created with my own hands. I felt a massive joy. Expos themselves are a social and cultural gathering for cultures and people to meet others. And Japan taught me lots of things. I learned from them how you don't need to know everything, but you need to learn everything. You need to have the spirit of learning regarding anything you want to do. After Osaka 1970, World Expos went on a 22-year hiatus and returned in 1992 in Sevilla, Spain. Of course, at that point, the union was 21 years old. We needed to introduce ourselves to the world and let them know that the seven Emirates united to become the UAE. Here's Abdullah al aydarus again. I remember a lot of visitors would come to us in the pavilion and ask, uh, is this Dubai? And I'd have to tell them, no, this isn't Dubai or Abu Dhabi, this is the United Arab Emirates. And that was Sheikh Zayed's vision, for the nation to be referred to as a whole, not as individual Emirates. Abdullah's first experience at an expo was Sevilla 1992, his favorite out of all the expos he attended other than Expo 2020 Dubai, of course. The theme in Sevilla was the Age of Discoveries, and the UAE once again had to come up with a pavilion design that would introduce the young country to the world. Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, I remember, asked his father, the founder of the country, what would you like the pavilion to look like? And Sheikh Zayed once again pointed to Al Jahili Fort in Al Ain, Qal'at Al Jahili, which belonged to his grandfather. If you remember, the pavilion in Osaka 1970 was also a replica of the fort. The display at the 1992 pavilion included replicas of Bronze Age tombs and artifacts curated by famed archaeologist Dr. Walid Yasin Al Tikriti. Other sections of the pavilion were devoted to the oil and energy industry, just like the Abu Dhabi pavilion in Osaka 1970. A reintroduction of sorts. Expo After 1992, our next stop is Hanover, Germany in the year 2000. 
Once again, the pavilion's design was inspired by the Al-Jahili Fort, but this time on a much larger scale. The pavilion was one of the largest on site at 3,000 square meters. I think the pavilion had a capacity of around 3,500 to 4,000 visitors at a time. The theme of the pavilion was from the traditional to the modern, and both were presented amidst the sand and palm trees that were actually flown into Germany from the UAE. You could see Il Jallaf, a man who builds ships at work. You could see men making fishing nets. You could see women who did embroidery on clothes called tilli in Emirati culture. You would see them adding uh, these beautiful designs to their jallabiyas on the sleeves. You could see bhaniyat, women who did hunna designs on visitors' hands. And of course, we had a kitchen that served traditional dishes and drinks, as well as the national folklore tree. For reference, the National Folklore Troupe has always played in UAE pavilions at World and Specialized Expos. And there's a fun story about the troupe that will come up in Shanghai 2010. But first, back to Hanover 2000. One day, we received word that Sheikh Zayed sponsored a cargo flight carrying all kinds of fresh seafood from the UAE to Germany. All kinds of seafood. Crab, octopus, fish, safi, shi'ri, small, large, every kind. And we were told that Sheikh Zayed wanted us to have a seafood day, like a traditional fish market almost. He wanted us to let visitors pick the seafood they wanted and show them how we would clean it and prepare it in the UAE, how we would cook it, how we would eat it with rice or otherwise, something else. And it was incredible because imagine, thousands of people that day came and got their Emirati seafood dish at the pavilion. Of course, the pavilion showcased the modern alongside the traditional. The pavilion was equipped with a 360-degree cinema that showed videos of the modern-day desert and thrilling falconry practices. Also, many aspects of the pavilion were made of recyclable materials, exhibiting the UAE's early interest in sustainability, which would become a theme of Expo 2020 Dubai. With all of this, it's no surprise that the UAE Pavilion was voted the best pavilion at Expo Hanover 2000 out of 155 participating nations and 39 international organizations. Now, it's worth noting that the UAE did not participate in Expo Aishi 2005 in Japan, but it did send representatives, including Abdullah, to experience the Expo and learn from it. This brings us to what Abdullah calls the UAE's strongest participation at a World Expo to date, Shanghai 2010 in China, under the theme of Better City, Better Life. That pavilion, for the first time in UAE pavilion history, had moved away from fort designs, and it did so in an incredible manner. The pavilion was shaped like sand dunes. We call it Aragib. There were two smaller sand dunes and a larger one. Each one of the smaller dunes had a capacity of 75 visitors and uh, played the same short film called Fi Lamh al Basar in the blink of an eye. The film follows the story of Rashid, a young boy who learns from his father about the founding of the UAE and its different cultural practices. Very good. The film showed visitors what life was like in the UAE in the past, before the Union, up until 1971, when the Union was formed and the country began transitioning into its glorious present. You would uh, then leave the small sand dunes and move into the larger one, which was an open space that had displays for Emirati arts and crafts. There, they would also see a short film called The Dream Journey. 
I wish I could see all the wonders you tell me about. Maybe you can. They are magic. Let me show you. The pearls of the Emirates. Behold! It's a dream! In this film, Rashid, the same boy from In the Blink of an Eye, takes his friend, a young Chinese girl, on a journey through the UAE. The film incorporates both live action and animation, and the two characters fly over deserts, walk through the cities, and swim under the sea. The film was around seven minutes only, but the visitor wouldn't even sit on a chair for those seven minutes. Why? From how exciting and thrilling the film is. People loved it. The UAE Pavilion also focused on the country's sustainability initiatives, such as the Muzdar City Project in Abu Dhabi, which intends to be one of the world's most sustainable urban communities. Again, this all fits under the theme of better city, better life. In the theme, if we showcased how the UAE in 40 years transformed and the sand dunes, which were designed by Foster and Partners, one of the most famous architects in the world, these sand dunes represented our history, our heritage, but they were made out of the best modern materials. And inside you could taste what life in the UAE was like and how we built the Emirates. For what? Better city, better life. This all fit the theme of the expo itself. The UAE National Folklore Troupe has been a staple of the UAE's participation at World Expos. And in Shanghai, they were supported by the country's leadership. In Shanghai, did we take the national troop? Of course we did. I wanted to get them there for at least 10 days during the expo's opening to present our culture. You know, the sounds of the instruments, the drums, the tambourines, the sound of sticks hitting the ground. It's not the same if you play it on a sound system. And to see Layala, Al Harbiya, Al Habban, Naashat in their traditional dresses, it has to be live. So we got them there for 10 days. We then were told that Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed would be visiting the expo shortly after those 10 days, so I asked for the troop to be kept longer. So Sheikh Abdullah visited, and I remember he visited the expo for three days, and every day he would start at the UAE pavilion, he would then make his way around the national pavilions, then come back to the UAE pavilion before leaving, and the troop played throughout. So when it came time for him to leave, uh, His Highness asked the pavilion's commissioner general Rule, you know, when is the troop leaving? And the Commissioner General responded, Your Highness, the troop will be leaving shortly after you leave. Sheikh Abdullah immediately asked for the troop to stay in Shanghai for the full duration of the expo. That's an additional five months. It goes to show the significance and impact of cultural and traditional presentations at World Expos. The UAE Pavilion, with its impressive offerings, led to it winning the award for the top pavilion at the expo. You can actually see those iconic sand dunes today at Minarat al-Sa'diyat in Abu Dhabi. The UAE did not stop there, however. Even after winning the bid in 2013 to host the expo in 2020, it left a strong impression at the Milan Expo in 2015, which had the theme, Feeding the Planet, Energy for Life. That pavilion, which you can see today in Muslar City, was once again designed by Foster and Partners and looked to the natural world for inspiration. It was made out of narrow walkways that had curved walls, imitating the natural curves and sand dunes, with desert plants surrounding visitors. Inside the pavilion, displays included a model of the Muhammad bin Rashid al-Maktoum solar park and a short 12-minute film titled The Family Tree. It focused on water and food waste by telling the story of a young girl named Sara who travels back in time to understand the importance of the palm tree. Wa 
وعليكم السلام سارة like many of our pavilions, the film and the display is focused on the UAE's past, present, and future. Of course, with a theme surrounding food, the UAE pavilion made sure to serve samples of traditional Emirati dishes. For free, we served Arabic hospitality. Al-gaymat, Arabic coffee, dates, chabab, and uh, depending on the time of day, dango, khabis, asid. We invited visitors to taste our food, not just see it in pictures. And the pavilion was a huge hit and won the award for best exterior design. It also showed the world that the UAE was ready to host the expo in five years. Of course, throughout this episode, we've only covered world expos. But the UAE also participated at several specialized expos that are an integral part of its journey. These are shorter, three-month expos that take place between two world expos. These included Lisbon, Portugal in 1998, which had a pavilion shaped after the Jelbut, or the traditional trade ship, Zaragoza, Spain, in 2008, where the UAE pavilion had a light show highlighting the importance of water to the country. And Yosu, South Korea, in 2012, where a fantastic film called The Turtle was shown. This film showed the country's focus on maritime activities such as fishing, sailing, and pearl diving, as well as the importance of conserving our oceans. All of these participations prepared the UAE to host its own expo, now open for the world to see. Abdullah was a BIE delegate in 2013, when Dubai had a decisive win against its competitors in Russia, Turkey and Brazil. I remember when we were about to enter the hall for the final vote, I was approached by an Emirati journalist and he asked me, you know, Abdullah, you've been participating in expos for so many years now and after this long career, do you think the UAE and Dubai will win? And I told him, the UAE, inshallah, will win. And we did win. <laughs> My feelings, uh, I can't describe it. And we won not by a small margin. It was significant. And the impact of expos is not temporary. A pavilion at an expo can lead to an increase in tourism to a country. And, and those people come and they say that what they're seeing in real life is so much more amazing than what they see in films. So what happens when the country actually hosts the expo? And it's not just tourism. I think investments will increase. Cultural researchers and intellectuals will visit the UAE artists. There are so many benefits. It's important to note that Expo 2020 Dubai opened its doors in the year of the UAE's Golden Jubilee. 50 years since the formation of the Union and 51 years since Abu Dhabi's appearance at the Osaka Expo of 1970. A long journey that is far from over. In honor of the next Expo being held, once again, in Osaka, Japan in 2025, we asked His Excellency Rashid al Nuaimi to see you through the finish line of our marathon as he reflects on the importance of Expos. The making of an expo in itself is a global endeavor. With the exchange of culture to other nations and people, every country makes their own culture, own innovations, and what they'd like to present to the rest of the world, that these are the makings of that country. You learn lots from it. From a social point of view, Expos are a social gathering where ideas are married, ideas challenge one another, and where growth happens when different people come together. It's an opportunity to get to know people's cultures and traditions, and therefore every individual is a cultural being. As a cultural being, you are a collection of learnings, from a book you've read, or a lecture you've attended. 
or something you've made with your own hands that you are proud of. And all these things make all of us. Everyone here in the UAE has an ambition to be a leader, to develop themselves, to push themselves. And I hope this trajectory continues, especially this generation that is fueled by science and innovation on this earth and beyond. And I hope for their success and happiness. Inside Expo takes you behind the scenes at Expo 2020 Dubai, sharing our stories and others across the 170-year history of this global event. Learn more by visiting virtualexpodubai.com. Inside Expo is produced by Kerning Cultures Network. We release episodes every Tuesday and Friday. Subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And if you enjoyed listening to this episode, share it with your friends and leave us a review.